Okay. You said, you're not changing the battery yet? Okay. So a person who has type 1 diabetes um, is not making enough insulin. So they have to usually take insulin so that they can properly regulate their blood glucose. A person who has type 2 diabetes is making plenty of insulin, but their muscles are not sensitive to it. So the insulin's not working, so they have a hard time regulating their glucose because they can't get glucose into the muscle. So what's happening is with the type 2 diabetes, the volume is going up on this guy's headphones and the glucose can't get into the muscle. So exercise, that's why exercise is very, very important for type, specifically type 2 diabetics. Because first of all, it's highly associated with obesity. So the more obese a person gets, the louder the music gets on the headphones, the less sensitive you are to the insulin. So regular exercise will decrease the diabetes, will decrease the volume on the headphones, and you can actually reverse it and become more sensitive to the insulin again. But with each exercise bout, the exercise also makes the guy turn down his headphones and makes you more sensitive to insulin. So someone who's who has type 2 diabetic diabetes, the more they exercise, the less insulin they need. <coughs> because exercise and insulin basically do the same thing. Okay? But in that case, someone who is taking insulin, it's very important that they not take insulin right before they exercise. Because if you take insulin, it's going to decrease your blood glucose. If you exercise, it's also going to decrease blood glucose, bringing glucose into the muscle. So if you do both of those at the same time, you end up hypoglycemic, and the person would end up passing out. So for a type 2 diabetic, exercise could sometimes replace insulin. It's one or the other. Okay. Um, so you, say about that. you guys have questions about that? I don't know how much you've studied diabetes. Number one says insulin promotes storage, which is counterproductive during exercise. Other questions? You guys don't have questions on all of that? You know, there was something else I was going to say. What is a good way to prevent, for example, your, your glucose level from, like if it happens a lot when you exercise and you pain, what's a good way to, like a rule of thumb to stop that? Okay, well that's a good question actually, that reminds me of what I was going to say. So, that shouldn't happen when you're exercising. Your glucose level should not drop when you're exercising. Because, um, well first of all, glucose, for glucose levels to go up and down like that is very, very dangerous. You need your glucose levels to stay steady. So as you're exercising, you are bringing glucose into the muscle for, for metabolism, but your glucose levels don't drop. How is that possible? Where are we getting more glucose from? The liver. What processes are happening in the liver to give us more glucose? Cori cycle and glycogenolysis. So remember, pyruvate, lactic acid, liver, remember there's this cycle. So as we're pulling glucose out of the blood into the muscle, we should be adding to the glucose pool at the same time so glucose levels will stay steady. If you pass out, probably what happened is you ran out of stored glycogen. Remember, you have enough glycogen stored for about two hours of exercise. So if you've been exercising for about two hours and you're passing out, that's because of hypoglycemia from glycogen depletion. That shouldn't be happening in less than that. If you're only exercising for 20, 30, 40 minutes, an hour, that shouldn't be happening. You should have plenty of left for that. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. But after two hours, that would, that's what that would be from. That's what you know all this. But otherwise, glucose levels should stay steady during exercise. Even though you're taking glucose into the muscle with the glute 4, glucose levels shouldn't drop because you have these processes that are constantly adding to Yes. So what does it mean when you are insufficient in the liver and you can the glycogen? Insufficient in the liver meaning low glycogen storage? Um, well, you, it's possible to increase your glycogen storage to some degree, unless there's some kind of, you're talking about some kind of pathology that prevents them from storing more glycogen. Mm -hmm. 
or that that is those processes? Yeah, what about the process? Um, I don't know. I guess there could be different pathologies within the liver that would that would stop would slow those processes, but I don't know what they're, what they're called. Someone has a question? Can you give another example for number three? Yeah. Muscles become more sensitive to insulin? Yeah. Okay, so um, another example besides my doorman. I so, think what I'm confused is the fact that insulin wants to be stored. Insulin wants glucose to be stored. Um, so why? Because are we saying that the muscles want to store the insulin? If, if insulin is bringing glucose into the muscle, it's trying to get it stored. Right. If GLUT4 is bringing glucose into the muscle, it's going to hopefully be metabolized. GLUT4 is specifically going to bring glucose to the exercising muscle. Insulin is going to bring it everywhere. So if you're riding a bike, <coughs> insulin is going to try to bring glucose into your bicep muscles and put it into storage. And your bicep muscles are becoming more sensitive to insulin as you're exercising. So this is not a good thing. And your quadriceps are also becoming more sensitive to insulin as you're exercising, which is not a good thing because we don't want glucose going into storage at that point. We want it going into your blood hollicis. Yeah. So is there an increase of glute 4 during exercise? Glute 4 will become more active during exercise, yes. And that's the word? So it's a hormone, right? It's a glucose transporter. Okay, so that's still coming from the pancreas? Uh, I don't think those are coming from the pancreas. So I'm not sure where they're coming from. Anything else? Okay, so that's all you need to know for chapter four. <coughs> those hormones, what they do, how they affect those enzymes and those processes, why we need insulin to decrease during exercise. Can you go over the adrenal glands and hormones and like what they do again? Okay. So the adrenal glands will secrete epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol when you're in the sympathetic nervous system, so when you're exercising. And the purpose of these hormones, as we're discussing right now, is to make your substrates more available. So they're all like the same thing. So they're all catabolic. So I gave you one, two, three, four, five hormones. Four of them are catabolic. One of them is anabolic. No, this is it. Yeah, I said that when I didn't speak. Yeah, this is. These are all the hormones we're going to cover. I gave you two endocrine glands and five hormones. Yes, and four of the hormones do the same thing. Only one of them is different. Okay. Um. So. We have a little bit of extra time if you guys have questions off the study guide, because when we come in for the review, I'm not going to be answering questions from the study guide. I'm going to be asking you guys questions. So you don't often get a chance to ask me questions from the study guide. So if you have any now, that you can kind of do it. Yes, so for example, when you're exercising, you release glucagon, that will activate the processes in the liver, the glucose 6-phosphatase and the glycogen phosphorylase, which will give you more glucose, which is going to help you increase HP. Uh, GLUT4 will be activated during that process, yes, to bring in glucose in the muscle. So when it asks, like, which hormones do you really like so that's all of the categories. Yes. Mm -hmm. On the study guide, um, cha chapter three, I said how does sensory motor integration work? Mm -hmm. um, I had a really basic definition here, just said integration of sensory and motor nervous system, and I was just trying mm -hmm. to figure out what else I could know. About. So um, I don't need much more than that. Just basically explain <coughs> what we mean by sensory and motor. So 
you're sensing something in your body, you're sending that information to the integration center, and you're sending out some kind of response. Okay. Also for the like, graded potential and the action potential, the graded is from the brain, but the action is just from the brain. So the action potential is the actual movement of the electrical signal down the neuron. Okay. The graded potential is the smaller signal that's coming from the brain that's not enough to achieve an action potential until you have it. Anything else? Yeah, so for glycolysis, remember I gave you two minutes for that, but I said the higher your intensity, the shorter time you'll be able to stay there. And that'll make more sense when we talk about fatigue in chapter five. But two minutes is what I Plasma glucose concentrations, that's on my study guide? Oh, okay. Okay, I thought you meant for defining it. Name the hormones that increase plasma glucose concentration. Okay, so that's the same as asking name the hormones that increase glucose levels. Plasma glucose concentration just means how much glucose is in your blood. So name the hormones that increase glucose levels. Okay. Uh, you have a question about the storage amount of the substrate. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mean like just regards to like the average body composition, like how much like fat, like muscle you have? No. So average substrate storage. Um, like I said, for carbohydrate, the average person stores enough carbohydrates for about two hours of moderate exercise. That's all I'm really looking for. The book goes into a little bit more detail, um, but I don't need the numbers. And then fat, we said, is unlimited. <coughs> and ATP, we have enough for about three seconds every 10 seconds. I thought this might be kind of basic, however, but describe a relaxed muscle in terms of action potential for muscle, calcium ions, Okay, so what are the myosin heads doing? They're at 90 degrees okay. with ATP and the phosphorus. Okay. No, ATP, ADP, inorganic phosphate, you can abbreviate, calcium, sodium, potassium, you can abbreviate. Once you've written out a term, any place else on the page, you can abbreviate it. But on a different page, you still have to write it out because I grade it page by page. So, like, I'll grade everybody's page three, and then I'll grade everybody's page four. So, when I get back to your test, I won't remember that you wrote it out on page three. So, each page, you have to write it out. What if you, like, put it up at the top and then, like, as you go through and write, draw into the diagram? Yes. So, you can abbreviate everything in your diagram and then put a key on it to the side. So you should know that NAD becomes NADH on its way to the electron transport chain and then FAD becomes FADH on its way to the electron transport chain. It is FADH2, um, but I won't mark off if you just put FADH. And then question was discuss the withdrawal reflex as a negative feedback loop. I have an example in my notes where it says uh, you put your hand on a hot stove, the body senses that that's happening since it's been close to the brain. Brain response by telling you to take your hand off the stove. Is that it? Yeah. Why is that negative feedback? Because you're stopping. You're, you're stopping. You're just, yeah. You're canceling. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the okay. Yeah. The withdrawal reflex is the one where you put your hand on the stove. Okay. How are you guys feeling? A little nervous. Yes. yes. Okay. You have one week. So when you come in on Thursday, the review will be Jeopardy style. So I'm going to put categories up on the board, there will be questions, you guys will be answering the questions, and I will be throwing candy at you. For the Wednesday class, or review is tomorrow? For the Wednesday class, the review is tomorrow. Yes. Yes. So come in ready to answer questions. If you have questions to ask, those are now for office hours.
Thank you. Yes, we bring back the...